For more than a decade, my father and I had talked about returning to the place where he made plastics before I was born. We stood on the grounds of the former Union Carbide plant in Boundbrook, New Jersey, the birthplace of modern plastics. A century earlier, in 1907, Leo Baiklin invented the first synthetic plastic in his laboratory in Yonkers, New York. He called his amber-hued invention Bakelite resin and chose the infinity symbol as its logo. In 1939, he sold his Boundbrook factory to Union Carbide. In 1962, my father started his first job at this factory as a process engineer. Within four years, the company promoted him to supervisor of their polystyrene department, a position he held until taking over the production of phenol, formaldehyde, and hexamethylene tetramine, the chemicals used to make Bakelite. In the U.S., by the close of the 1940s, oil had replaced both biomass and coal as the substrate for making the stuff of everyday life. Union Carbide helped lead that conversion. By the close of 1963, Union Carbide had made one billion pounds of plastic in a single year. By spring 2013, on the day we visited, only a few buildings remained. My father's voice cracked when we pulled down Bakelin Avenue. He gaped in disbelief at the ghost of his old factory. We drove the perimeter past the lot where he once parked. An old emergency vehicle still bearing the Union Carbide logo slumped in the grass. At the rear entrance, we parked where the rusted rail line slipped under the padlock gates, its branches warped. I tried to picture the tankers of styrene entering on one branch, the freight cars filled with polystyrene pellets exiting from another, and the trucks rumbling over the tracks with their payload of 55-gallon drums carrying away everything else. When I asked why he left Carbide, a place many stayed for life, he said, there had to be a higher calling. My father eventually learned what happened to other drums that had been stockpiled at the Boundbrook plant. In 1971, in the span of just five months, a third-party waste hauler stashed at least 5,000 barrels at a farm in Tom's River, the one that would become a Superfund site. All told, an unknowable mixture of chemicals had seeped into the soil and spread to the well fields supplying Tom's River. By the 1990s, the public outcry over the pollution and childhood cancers in Tom's River reached its pinnacle. Though he never managed the waste, my father came to wonder whether he had unwittingly played some part in the manufacturing of what wound up in Tom's River. It felt like a battleground, the kind of place people visit to reckon with their legacy, except my father was anxious and wanted to leave immediately. We shouldn't be here, he said. My father reaches into his back pocket to pull out a handkerchief. He wipes my eyes before his. We know there can't be closure, so we stay there side by side before climbing back into the car to follow the river to the sea.